This is the launch of the Arms Out Tour, which is a collaboration between CAT, uh, Forces Watch, Demilitarized Education, and Shadow World Investigations. My name's Kirsten, Kirsten Bays. I'm CAT's uh, local outreach coordinator, and I'll be uh, hosting the event this evening. So the Arms Out Tour is uh, intended to bring um, films, uh, panel discussions and workshops to local areas. And so uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about that, but also we're going to be watching some of the films that, 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 that we have available, um, uh, as well as uh, interviewing some of the people who are involved and, and some of the organizations that are that are, are, are making the tour happen. So thank you. So uh, with me uh, is uh, Matt. So uh, Matt, if you'd like to introduce yourself and just say, say some words. Sure. Um... My name is Matt Kennard. I am, what am I? Uh, uh, Chief Investigator at Declassified UK and co-founder of Declassified UK, uh, which was founded in 2019 um, with the uh, historian and journalist Mark Curtis to kind of um, remedy the fact that the mainstream media doesn't cover uh, critically British foreign policy uh, and hasn't for a long time. And we've, uh, I think we've kind of completed part of that mission in ter in term, well, on various different issues, but the 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 issue of the film tonight is Yemen. <clears throat> and before the genocide in Gaza, um, Yemen was uh, our main focus, I guess, for the first three or four years because uh, the Saudi-led um, war in Yemen, uh, which began in 2015, um, was uh, unbelievably savage. Um, and Kat did a lot of great work on this as well, including taking the government to court to try and get them to stop arming the Saudis. But what we did journalistically was uh, this was always presented as a Saudi war and Saudi war crimes were presented as uh, only Saudi war crimes. And in fact, the British, uh, it was a British war as well, uh, explicitly in, in many cases. I'll give a few examples. <clears throat> there were for the whole of the, um, uh, the brutal um, uh, air war in Yemen, there were three. UK military personnel sat inside the Saudi Air Operations Center. Um, we have 12 tr of, uh, military officers embedded in the Saudi military. We've had those since 1964. Um, we, uh, uh, it, the, we, the whole Typhoon fighter jet fleet that they were using to bomb Yemen was, uh, was sold by the British BAE systems, and that comes onto the film. So when while we were covering all this stuff, we wanted to find a tangible way of getting the story out. Um, and we found that uh, a flight went from this BAE factory. BAE Systems is the UK's largest arms company. <clears throat> it uh, dwarfs all the rest of them. And basically, their money, most of it comes from the Saudis. 40% of British arms go to the Saudis, and most of it goes to BAE. Um, the, the money. Um, so we were like, how, how can we cover this in a way that can get the story out to people um, in a way that's not really dry um, uh, and, and off-putting? So we found that this flight went from this uh, BAE factory in Wharton, which is a tiny little town, you'll see it in the film, uh, near Preston. Um, and and they they every, every, every week this flight was going from Wharton to Cyprus, which we can talk about maybe after the film, the, the UK has an RAF base in Cyprus, which is actually supplying weapons to Israel right now, um, being used to supply weapons to Israel. Uh, but this, so this flight went from Wharton to Cyprus, then on to, this, uh, to Saudi Arabia. And this was uh, carrying spare parts and other bits and bobs for, for the Typhoon fighter jet fleet. So ex uh, explicit um, complicity in the air war in Yemen. It also goes for, sorry, I'll just finish with this because I, I know I haven't got much time. It also goes with, for the uh, blockade as well, <clears throat> which isn't related specifically to arms, but it is related specifically to uh, the UK military because the UK military, we revealed through a series of uh, investigations, was, uh, uh, was training uh, the Saudi Navy and actually had uh, UK military personnel embedded in the Navy as well. And that they enforced a, a savage blockade uh, from 2016 onwards uh, around Yemen, which created the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, millions, 2.3 million kids uh, were, were pushed to the verge of starvation. <clears throat> There's awful images uh, that, that, are, that are online of what, what we did to the kids of Yemen. And the, the Br British were complicit in that as well. So it was a British war. This... Um, 
this film uh, was produced. So again, this and, and again, uh, a really important part of this is the media does not cover this stuff. So the British people cannot take action because they're not told. We were the only ones. Bear in mind, Declassified was there's four four people, two of two journalists, myself and Phil Miller, who made the film. Uh, and we did more than any the rest of the media combined to reveal the British role. This film was the budget for it was 150 pounds. It paid for the petrol for the car for me and Phil to go up there and then a night for each of us in a cheap hotel in the outskirts of Preston. Imagine if so while you're watching this, imagine what how uh, how how the system would change immediately if the mainstream media used their resources. We're talking hundreds, thousands of journalists, millions of pounds to actually reveal the true role of the British. But in fact, what the mainstream media does is the opposite. They cover for the role of the British and echo and amplify the British government's narrative and their position on all these issues. Thank you very much. So, as I say, without further ado, uh, let's introduce our film, um, which is Wharton's War on Yemen. The oil-rich kingdom of Saudi Arabia is one of Britain's best friends in the Middle East. A friendship worth billions of pounds to the UK's largest arms dealer, BAE Systems. But is the British establishment too close to a regime which is credibly accused of torture, murder and war crimes? And what do the British public think about this secretive special relationship? I, I regret very deeply that I ever had anything to do with that. I'd be quite concerned about that, to be quite honest. The fact that we're supporting Saudi Arabia is what I have a problem with. No, I don't believe a damn word this government says. I'm here outside the Saudi embassy in London. It was at an embassy like this in Istanbul where Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post columnist, was lured by Saudi diplomats and chopped up inside with a bone saw. Khashoggi's last column for the Washington Post called for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to end the brutal war in Yemen, which has created the world's worst humanitarian disaster. Many say the Saudi assault on Yemen couldn't continue without British support. To find out if this is true, I tracked down someone who has worked on the inside. This is the first time they've spoken to a journalist on camera. My name's Molly Mulready and I was a lawyer at the British Foreign Office when Boris Johnson was in charge there. I was working there when Saudi Arabia started to bomb Yemen, which they've continued to do ever since. BAE Systems is a company that makes the weapons that get sold to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Anyone British or in Britain who wants to export arms has to get a license, an arms exports license, and they get that by applying to the Department for International Trade. The Department for International Trade, in considering whether to grant the license, they consult the Foreign Office. You had meetings with Boris Johnson while he was Foreign Secretary on the issue of the Saudi war in Yemen. Can you briefly describe what those meetings were like? Boris Johnson was very like casual and jokey when we would go in to talk to him about um, arms to Saudi Arabia. Um, we would go in to brief him about Yemen and he would just like joke around and waste everybody's time. And it, it was a bit mind blowing because it was, you know, you're, you're discussing civilian casualties. You're discussing the fact that innocent people have died and that British supplied bombs have played part in that. A former BAE worker has said the Saudi Air Force will be grounded within a fortnight without the British company's support. I asked Mauridi if the Saudis could keep bombing Yemen without help from BAE. I think it would be extremely difficult. Um, I think they could keep bombing for a short time, but they couldn't sustain the level of activity, the level of military activity that they're doing at the moment or that they've sustained over the six years without, um, without BAE systems um, kit being supplied to them. For over 40 years, British Aerospace Wharton has been at the forefront in the design and development of high-performance combat aircraft. Wharton provides support for its products in over 24 countries. We're on our way up to BAE Wharton, which is a factory 
uh, run by the UK's largest arms company, BAE Systems. Um, and we've seen that they have a flight which leaves every Wednesday morning, which ends up in Saudi Arabia. And we believe it carries supplies for their Typhoon fighter jet fleet, which is currently bombing Yemen. Let's see what they say when we get up there. Coming up to uh, the airstrip now. There's a plane there. So we just arrived at BAE Wharton in Lancashire, um, which is one of the beating hearts of the UK operation to support the Saudi war in Yemen. Just as we got here, a Hawk fighter jet uh, taxied down the runway and then took off. Here we go. We're going to have a little look at the residential properties which are adjacent. So the house on the end, which has a window which literally overlooks the planes, the noise when that Hawk jet took off was intense. So I wonder how these people live with that kind of noise. It's, it's, it's more intense than your average aircraft. The Hawk's going round. I don't think it's after us. This Hawk jet is being sold as part of a £5 billion deal to Qatar, a super-rich Gulf regime which is accused of supporting terrorism. Previous BAE customers have included Zimbabwean dictator Robert Mugabe, who used his Hawks to bomb the Congo in one of the deadliest conflicts since the First World War. Practically alone among frontline trainers, the Hawk has the ability to go operational and pack a healthy wallop. Indonesia's genocidal dictator General Suharto was another buyer, finding the hawk helpful for his illegal occupation of East Timor. And Saudi Arabia is one of BAE's most loyal customers, buying dozens of hawks from here in Wharton to train its pilots before they can fly the company's more powerful tornado and typhoon aircraft. Saudis have spent millions and millions of pounds on buying British supplied kit, on buying stuff from BAE systems. And it's not like you can just, you know, buy a bomb from China and put it in a BAE systems plane. It won't work. The technology is so advanced and it's all um, very much reliant on, you know, the same kit from, coming from the same supplier. It, it, you can't mix and match your, uh, your arms dealers. It, it just doesn't work like that. Um, and so the idea that, you know, if Britain stopped arming Saudi Arabia, there'd be like an immediate replacement for what we do. It's, it's just not true. Um, and Britain stopping arming Saudi Arabia would have a significant effect on Saudi military capability. We're sat outside the um, pub. Which is next to the BA water. What's your name again? Uh, a lot of locals. And now Grealish. Grealish in! After England beat Germany in the Euros, a fellow spectator agreed to give me an interview. I'm here um, next to BAE Wharton with Gary Isaacs, who lives actually next to the aerodrome. Yeah, well, where we live, we're literally at the bottom of the runway. You can see the whites of their eyes sometimes of the pilots when they're coming in, and some of them actually quite enjoy put a bit of an afterburner on and get all the alarms going and all, everywhere where you live. And uh, yes, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's di certainly different. In terms of how BAE Systems as a company is viewed by the local community, is it, I imagine, because it's the main employer, it's viewed quite kindly. Is that, would that be fair or, or are there problems with, with the company from the local point of view? I mean, it brings a lot of economy into the area. Uh, a lot of people move over here. So, yeah, it's fine. We've got houses being built. We've got great pubs. Do you think that there's an awareness in the local Wharton community about what 
actually happens there and, and where the flights are going and what they're what kind of operations they're involved in or is it kind of just not really talked about there is planes that come in sometimes and there may be a camouflage I look like camouflage planes are coming i think what we believe is they're coming for an mot or something like that and they pop down but we don't see much on that side no no do you think that people would be shocked or outraged if they knew that there were flights coming from here that were going to saudi arabia to help them bomb yemen nobody knows anything like that we only know what goes on here in wharton we don't know if the flights come in and then disappear out somewhere else we just think they're going to farnborough or you know wherever they're going we no, I'd be quite concerned about that, to be quite honest. On the other side of the factory is Freckleton, a village where almost no one was willing to speak on camera about BAE. I but, ain't talking. Yeah, <laughs> that's the reaction we've been getting, yeah. Steve will talk to you, Steve! Well, you could ask Steve. We're making a short film about uh, BAE Wharton. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we wanted to talk to some locals about what it's like to live next door to it. Um, I like the planes, and I think it's good for business. Would you be able? To, would you willing no. to say that on camera? No. no okay. Absolutely fair enough. not. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Pretty much no one will speak because everyone either works in the aerodrome or has family or friends that do. So there's a real um, wall of silence about what's happening inside there. Eventually, a lifelong resident of Freckleton, also called Steve, did agree to speak to me. Are you aware of what's happening there in terms of where the planes are going or what they're doing? Yeah, we know they've got big contracts with Saudi and, and uh, well, the various countries over the world where they go and uh, obviously maintain the uh, planes as well, get them up in the air and train the people that are, are going to fly them. And we found it quite difficult to um, get people to talk on camera about the aerodrome. Do you know, why do you think that is? Is it because most people have a connection to it around here or what is it? Well, certainly a lot of people work at Airspace Locally, that's for sure, yeah, but, uh, I mean, I just say how it is. I mean, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I'm aware of the war in the Yemen and other places of that. I mean, I watch the news, this, that and other, and uh, I don't agree with it. Uh, whether I agree to sell in arms to these countries or players to these countries is a different matter. Uh, I suppose it comes down to everything else, like whatever they want to say, it's down to pounds, shilling and pence, isn't it? Money, money speaks, money's the god nowadays. Do you think they should stop arms to Saudi Arabia completely, the UK government, stop all licences? Look, I think there's quite a bit of, of uh, split opinion on the Saudi job. Like I say, I don't believe in war, so I mean, uh, I, you know, I, if I've got an argument with somebody, I'll go outside and we can have a few fisticuffs uh, and, and get it sorted and be friends the day after. Not killing people in cold blood, no. I don't like it. So you'd like the government to stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia? I'd like the government to stop selling arms to any country that's at war. Absolutely. In 2017, campaigners tried to stop Saudi arms sales at the High Court. Mulready helped the Foreign Office to defend these deadly exports. The UK government won, allowing it to continue arming the Saudis. How did it make you feel working for the Foreign Office during the war in Yemen? When you're working on this, you are obviously receiving a lot of information about what's happening in Yemen. And it's absolutely terrible. And for me, the only way I could, con I could actually do the work on it was to like slightly, you know, put it in a different compartment of my brain, the suffering that was happening and just, just not properly emotionally engage with it. I, I had thought for a long time about what I should do with what I knew about exporting arms to Saudi Arabia, um, what I knew about the law and what I knew about the facts. Um, and that swirled around in my conscience for such a long time. I wanted to expose it. Um, and there are, still, there are still things that I know that I can't talk about because I'm, I'm worried, because I'm frightened, basically. Can you briefly describe how the British government is breaking the law by its continued arms sales to Saudi Arabia? So what the law says is that the government will not grant a licence where there is a clear risk the items to be licensed might, only might, be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. 
And obviously, when you're looking at what might happen in the future, you look at what has happened in the past. And when you look at the way the Saudis have conducted themselves in Yemen, and you look at the numbers of civilian casualties, and you look at incidents like the funeral hall in Sana'a, where it was well known to the extent that it was advertised on Facebook that there was a funeral going on there. There were hundreds of people in a room and the Saudis bombed it. They cannot have not known that there were civilians in there. And even if there were military targets in there, the number of civilian casualties was disproportionate. And so that was an unlawful strike. That was a serious violation of international humanitarian law. It is well known. The British government know that that happened. That is an incident that was not unique. That was not a one-off. Things like that happened again and again and again for six years. The British government cannot plausibly say that there is not a clear risk that one such incident, just one, might, only might. How, I mean, I just, I, I, it beggars belief that they stand up and say that with a straight face, but they do. So that's why it's my view that it's unlawful. In 2019, the Court of Appeal suspended some arms sales to Saudi Arabia. But a year later, the government resumed all of these exports. These were isolated incidents, and our analysis shows that Saudi Arabia does have a genuine intent and the capacity to comply with international humanitarian law and the specific commitments it has made. It is on that basis that the Secretary of State has assessed that there is not a clear risk that the export of arms and military equipment to Saudi Arabia might be used in the commission of a serious violation of international humanitarian law. I'm so ashamed that I had anything to do with it. Sorry, give me a second. Um, so, there have been tens of thousands of civilians killed in the bombing, and there are millions of people who are food insecure. There are children in Yemen who are starving to death. The Saudis seem to have absolutely no compassion whatsoever. We're here now at BAE Wharton around the perimeter and behind me you can actually see the plane that we've come to look at, um, which is the plane that will end up in Saudi Arabia um, tomorrow via Cyprus. Um, it's being loaded up with materials right now to help the Saudis maintain and service their flight of Typhoon fighter jets which are bombing Yemen. So we're gonna go now to the other side of the, the aerodrome to see the actual plane take off in a couple of hours. Coming up the runway now. So it will initially land later today in Cyprus at RAF Akrotiri, which is a UK military base on Cyprus. Um, it will stay there overnight and fly on to Saudi Arabia tomorrow. And the flag that you see that looks like a German flag is actually the flag of the company West Atlantic UK, which leases the plane to BAE Systems for this weekly flight. It's coming up right next to us now. It's taxiing down the runway. And there you can see West Atlantic rearing on the side. With the tail number. It's turning round right next to us. The time is 
10 to 12. This flight is carrying cargo, which will help the Saudi Arabians maintain their air force and their Typhoon fighter jets, which are being used to pummel Yemen and have created the world's worst humanitarian disaster here. So you're looking at a, a key piece in the Saudi war machine taking off from the heart of Lancashire. Here we go. In a few hours time, the plane will refuel in Cyprus, where its flight manifest is inspected by British customs officials stationed at the RAF base. But they claim not to be subject to the Freedom of Information Act, making it impossible for us to know exactly what cargo is on the flight. The Defence Minister has only told Parliament in vague terms that the flight provides logistic support for UK supplied aircraft and systems operated by the Royal Saudi Air Force, which play a key role in the defence and security of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, I'm just going to go up to the BAE site now uh, and try and ask for an interview to find out what is on that cargo flight that left this morning. So let's see how this goes. Hello, I'm a journalist. I'm looking to speak to someone at BAE Wharton about flight that went this morning. Um, flight that went this morning? Yeah, there's a flight that goes to Saudi Arabia every Wednesday carrying spare parts and other cargo. And I kind of wanted to find out what is on it. I don't think there's many upcoming speech here is that such. Um, other than that, I know where you are because obviously we've never spotted you. Yeah. So that, that, there's not many people who would speak to anyway. Okay. Is it okay. is it possible to uh, speak to someone within there? Although BAE would not give us an interview. The company's chairman, Sir Roger Carr, was secretly recorded in 2019 making these comments to shareholders. Civilians are killed in war. The solution is to stop wars at the earliest opportunity. And our belief is that if you supply first class equipment, you are the encouragement, particularly when used in defence, for people to stop fighting. But two years after he made those remarks, the war in Yemen rages on. <laughs> suggesting BAE's arms exports have failed to stop the suffering. We travelled to Preston, the nearest city to Wharton, to speak to people there about this deadly trade. Were you aware that there's a flight that goes from Wharton, which is just 10 minutes up the road, every week? to Saudi Arabia to help them maintain their fighter jets which are bombing Yemen. Were you aware about that? That doesn't sound good at all to me, no. And I think if people were aware on a more personal level, that yeah, I think people would feel quite angry about it. People are starving. There's a lot of problems with healthcare and you don't really hear much about it. And um, we do a lot of dealings with Saudi Arabia. So, and they're never really put in the picture when, when Yemen is talked about which is a bit annoying, really. But I think that this is something the government should be really sorting out, you know, because a lot of the people going to work in these places, just going to work and, yeah. you know, and but that, yeah, that connection sounds pretty bad. Boris Johnson recently visited Wharton and stressed this importance to the UK's economy. Hi, folks, I'm here at BAE Systems in Wharton in Lancashire, where I've just been talking to some of the apprentices and what these young people are doing here in Lancashire is not only helping to make our country safe, but they're also part of our levelling up agenda, driving jobs and growth across the whole of the UK. But do the economic arguments for Wharton actually add up? I think the government is being dishonest. The government knows that there are jobs not in the arms industry um, that could replace those jobs. Um, we are in a, you know, climate change emergency. Um, there is so much development that needs to take place in that area that it is unthinkable that the only the only job is making weapons it, that's not credible um, and i think the government just uses that argument to try and make it to try and have something to say that isn't just you know we love money and we make huge profits from this 
BAE has sold £17.6 billion worth of weapons and services to the Saudi military since it began bombing Yemen in 2015. Its chairman, Sir Roger Carr, has an annual salary of £700,000. Last month, he was pictured in London at an arms fair with the Saudi ambassador. My colleague Phil Miller then saw the ambassador, flanked by senior Saudi Air Force officers, having a friendly chat with Britain's Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. Mr Wallace, did Mohammed bin Salman order the killing of Jamal Khashoggi? Secretary Wallace, are your relations with the Saudi regime appropriate, given they orchestrated the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi? The Saudis have been our friends for many, many, many decades. Ben Wallace is right. Britain's friendship with Saudi Arabia has lasted for decades, with BAE at the very heart of it. But how many more Yemeni civilians will have to pay the price for this secretive special relationship? Thank you. Um, so watching that again, as you're as you're um, thinking back to that 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 trip that you made up to to Wharton, what are your thoughts? You know what? Uh, it was interesting watching it. I haven't watched that for ages. And when I was watching Molly Mulready talk about uh, Yemen, it was making me think of Gaza because she she was talking about the, uh, the 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 fact she used the phrase the Saudis have absolutely no uh heart at all in their bombing command they just don't that civilians aren't a, a consideration at all and the starvation of uh, the children as well and what we're seeing in gaza it's like that on it's, it's it's worse than what we saw in yemen i mean she was talking about tens of thousands of civilians being killed in six years of war we've seen that in in gaza in three months so um that was my main thought but I, also it's all part of the same system the same war machine because also uh, we uh, as you would have seen description of that flight path to set the saudi arabians went via cyprus raf akrotiri mm -hmm. and raf akrotiri are based on cyprus which we which we retained after cyprus achieved independence so-called independence in 1960 but it obviously didn't achieve independence it's got two massive uk military bases on it but um that is now being used to supply arms to israel to bomb Gaza um and that is I mean that is the uh, when they have when they when they initiate these bombing campaigns and these war crimes all the different pressure points of the empire are revealed in a way because the, the I, I've been to RAF at criteria I went a couple of years ago <laughs> for a story and the interesting thing about it is it you would never know that you're entering British territory. There's no British flags. There's no border control. There's nothing. And people I talked to there said that's because the British don't want anyone to know that they're there effectively because Cyprus has been illegally occupied by Turkey since 1974. Um, and that when you go to the border with the northern Cyprus, like there's there's uh, Turkish flags beaming out from the hills everywhere. Um, and obviously the the Cypriots are very much uh it's very hostile to that occupation uh and they don't want the same um uh kind of uh animosity towards the British presence so it's just completely kept at a very very low level but we at declassified we've revealed um the role of RAF criteria and it sparked demonstrations in Cyprus now uh because Cypriots are becoming aware that their island is being used as a major cog in the war machine and a major cog to perpetrate uh, the genocide in in uh, Gaza. Um, and it's all part of the same system. The Saudis, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's an empire, and we're not allowed to say that. 
but the empire never died. The British Empire didn't die. And this is so obvious from this the these Yemen, but even more so of Gaza, because <clears throat> what kind if we're not an empire, why do we have why do we own why do we have two huge military bases in Cyprus that comprise three percent of the the what the uh the island? Why do we still own Gibraltar in the Western Mediterranean? We we own the two most important parts of the the Mediterranean. We have a massive naval base in Gibraltar, which controls the western choke point and entry into the Mediterranean, and we control the eastern Mediterranean through these bases on Cyprus. So, yeah, just the continuity, I guess. If if I was good, well, what I was watching, that I was just thinking, wow, this is all this is all the same thing, and uh, this is what we really need to take on. And I think it's it's possible to take it on, but what needs to happen is we need to reveal the truth because this story as i mentioned in the intro why why is bbc not making this film why channel 4 not making this film as i said the budget was 150 pounds they could spend half a million pounds and make a very a much more polished version of that and change if that was shown prime time on bbc uh bbc or bbc one things would change very very quickly i think that the only reason that the empire uh, continues to operate and continues to to um, to commit such awful crimes like we're seeing in Gaza currently, is because the media covers for the empire or at least makes sure that it's hidden. Like I'll, I'll just finish with this because with the with the role of RAF at criteria that I mentioned, that declassified's done the only work. Again, we're two reporters. In fact, Phil was uh, on mater uh, maternity leave for most of the, the the early part of it, so it was just me and. We have completely put that on the map. If you had The Guardian or The Telegraph or the BBC or anyone doing these stories, I really think that the whole system, the whole exploitative uh, war machine would, would collapse within a couple of months. It really would. It, it rests, the existence of that war machine rests on the fact that the media doesn't do its job. So I think that's why this arms, uh, this arms out tour is extremely important because the, the, in a society like ours, we don't get put in prison for doing dissident journalism, but what we do is we get marginalised. So we all, so we have to go around the country and show it in 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 local communities and stuff. But it has an impact, and it's important that we do that because there's no other way around it. We we got social media now, so we can circumvent the mainstream media a bit more. But getting out into communities and showing films like this, um, <clears throat> and getting the word out from all these great organisations is extremely important. Um, and I think it's the key to. Um, changing the narrative and, and raising awareness of what our real role in the world is um, and how involved we are in, in some of the worst crimes of the modern era. Yeah, I, I was going to ask a question about um, one of the points that uh, Marie, Marie, the, the lawyer, made was about um, compassion and a, a lack of it. Um, and she was talking about that in the Saudi context. But I, I think as I don't know about you, but as, as I've watched some of the coverage of Gaza, you kind of do wonder where what has happened to people's compassion? What, what what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, the system filters good people out, doesn't it? The political system, all the worst people rise to the top. But I have been shocked, I have to say, even by, by the, because the as I say, I think actually Gaza is on a different level to what was seen in Yemen. Maybe not the, the starvation, the blockade caused uh, uh, millions of kids to like, uh, to the point of starvation, but actually in Gaza, that's also happening. But, um, but it has been unbelievable to watch in real time a genocide take place and to watch our leaders literally not blink in their loyal support for the for the state that is that is uh, perpetrating it. It has I, I think a, a lot of people I talk to now said uh, I'm changed after this experience, um, which is horrific what it's done to uh, what, what what it's done to the people of Gaza but uh and and the psychological impact on a lot of people but it is a moment for transformation because I think if we don't if we don't uh, what has been shown is that we're ruled by psychos that don't have red lines there's no red line there's nothing the Israelis could do I don't think that would actually that Rishi Sunak or Joe Biden would actually say stop because what more can they do they're bombing hospitals they're invading hospitals they're torturing doctors they're mutilating kids. They're, I mean, they're, 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 I can't think of anything worse, you know. Um, and they, they, they're, they're saying nothing. So, so, I th but I think that this has been a, this will should be a transformation, a transformative moment. If it's not, then we failed uh, because I think that the contradiction between 
the rubbish we're told by the propaganda system, which is that we're interested in human rights and democracy, and that's what our foreign policy rests on. A lot of people, I mean, I've I've known that's bullshit for a long time, and a lot of people have, but the general society at large, I don't think has. And I think that this Gaza experience has woken up a lot of people because you're watching some of the worst stuff you've ever seen in your life, and then you're watching politicians come on TV the next day and, and defend it, your own your own elected politicians. And um, I think that people, this is an opportunity for all of us, and we need to take that opportunity to to really ram home the fact that this is, uh, well, like I said, this is a, a an extension of, of an empire. We are an empire, and the empire is not interested in human rights or democracy. The empire is interested in uh, geopolitical control and sucking money out of the the, the developing world or the global south. Um, and that's what the whole system rests on. Um, uh, it kind that's completely opposite to what we're told from when we're kids. But I think that that realization is coming now to a lot of people. Um, I don't know if it will last. I mean, I, I, there have been obviously horrific aggressions by the Israelis in Gaza in 2014, 2009. And I remember thinking at those times, okay, well, this is, people have woken up to what the reality of the Western-backed uh, Israeli regime is. Um, but and but then it went back to how it was before. But I think this time it's become so extreme that uh, it won't go back and it can't go back. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the think tank industrial complex, the media can't put the mask back on because the mask is off now. We need to keep the mask off. Um, uh, and uh, I think the key to that, as I said, is activism in the local communities and and independent media and and i'll just finish with this i think the other realization that we that many people have had and we need to hold on to and promote is that we don't live in a democracy because as i mentioned we're watching politicians on the screen supporting the genocide supporting mutilation of children the mass murder of children over ten thousand children in three months murdered um and it's not just rishi sunak and joe biden in the white house it's Keir Starmer. Uh, and the labor, the upper echelons of the Labour Party, it's obviously the Republicans and the Democrats in the United States. So we don't have a democracy. If you can't vote, if you can't go out to vote for a party that might, that has a chance of getting into government that isn't anti-genocide, then that's a big problem. We can't do that. The next election, we can't vote for a party that might form a government that's not anti-genocide. So uh, I think that a lot of people are waking up to that as well. And, and, uh, the whole system needs to be transformed from top to bottom, Thank you. in my opinion. Thank you. I'm aware people will have thoughts and, and questions. I, I'd like to keep us moving through the different films, but I think one of the things what we're trying to do as we're as we're looking at these different films is is indeed our thoughts are with what's going on in Gaza and, and, and the system. And in some ways it's trying to understand the system that's behind some of the the war that we're seeing that's, that's underpinning a lot of what we're seeing and it, it is being applied in different different areas okay so thank you thank you very much um thank you thank you very much matt so we're about to move on to the the, the, the second film um this film uh was made uh by our friends rainbow collective in partnership with london cat and i'm looking across at uh, some folks from london cat today uh, including sam whose voice you'll you'll hear um uh, it, it's it's called um, and it's it's a it's got a fairly long title, so I'm going to read it. Arms sales to dictators, displacement, and militarized borders. And Andrew is going to be joining as as taking over the chair because I'm introducing it, and then we'll have a little bit of a Q and A. Um, but it it starts to talk about uh, another major war and conflict that 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 has been impacting uh, the Middle East, but also has 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 found its way. Um, uh, across the borders from from what we're talking about Syria into into, into Turkey and, and Kurdistan, um, and I think the other thing to say as well is is that uh, as Syria has has led to one of the kind of biggest flows of people seeking safety and and seeking the, the, seeking the escape from, from from warfare and just the disaster that it that it creates, uh, and and so. Many of my neighbours are Syrian, and I, you know, they are my neighbours, and I'd love to have them. But I also know that they've come from a very difficult situation. So this talks about some of that. So uh, if we may, um, we'll move on to the, to, to the second film. So Arms Sales to Dictators, 
displacement and militarized borders. This short video examines displacement and militarized borders. It focuses on the UK government's actions in the Syrian civil war, which has resulted in the largest number of displaced people from the Arab Spring conflicts. The UNHCR estimates that there are 6.9 million internally displaced Syrians and 5.6 million living abroad. The UK government and UK arms trade have supported governments who have gassed bombed, shot at Syrians, have made their attempts to seek refuge excruciatingly difficult and have ethnically cleansed the Kurdish Syrian population. To gain a broader understanding of the UK government and arms trade involvement in the Arab Spring, check out our video on the Arab Spring, link in the description. In the decade leading up to the Syrian civil war, New Labour permitted the sale of chemicals which can be used to make chemical weapons, known as chemical weapon precursors, to President Bashar al-Assad. Despite the fact that at that point Syria was a country of concern and only had the Syrian government's assurance that they wouldn't be used to make chemical weapons. This trade relationship continued during the Cameron government and, appallingly, into the start of the Syrian civil war. As late as January 2012, the UK government granted export licenses for chemicals that can be used as precursors to chemical weapons, though thankfully the introduction of an EU arms embargo led to the licenses being cancelled before the chemicals were delivered. What would happen now that we have left the EU and its associated arms embargoes? A 2014 scrutiny on arms exports and arms controls House of Commons Select Committee commented on the issue. And I quote, the decision of the present government to give two export license approvals for dual-use chemicals to Syria in January 2012, after the civil war had started in Syria in 2011, was irresponsible given that Syria was a known holder of chemical weapons, that Syria was a known non-signatory of the Chemical Weapons Convention, the nature of the Assad regime, that a civil war was raging in Syria. In July 2012, the UK government revoked the precursor chemical export licenses to Bashar al-Assad. On December the 23rd, 2012, the first chemical weapons attack on Syrians by Assad were reported in Homs, causing the death of seven civilians. Eight months later, Assad dropped chemical weapons on the Ghouta suburb of Damascus, killing between 281 and 1,429 people. Whilst it is not clear if previous UK exports were used in any of these attacks, it is clear that the UK government and arms companies are happy to permit the sale of precursor chemicals to despotic leaders willing to gas their own populations. Furthermore, the UK government routinely suppressed attempts at accountability. For example, the then Business Secretary Vince Cable refused to name the two companies who applied for the 2012 export licenses. Those displaced by the civil war have been prevented from leaving Syria. In 2017, the UNHCR reported that while the conflict in Syria and the reasons for displacement continue, few Syrians are able to leave due to restrictive border management by neighboring countries. For example, Turkey has been accused of obstructing and militarizing its border. Human Rights Watch has condemned Turkey for killing people attempting to cross the border. Turkey does this with the help of exported UK weapons, including sniper rifles, machine guns, various types of missiles, and parts for combat helicopters and military combat vehicles. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, 471 civilians, including 86 children, have been killed by the Turkish border guards since the beginning of the civil war. Many of the deaths are of those attempting to escape from Syria into Turkey. Worse still is what US diplomat to Syria, amongst many others, is calling the Turkish ethnic cleansing of Kurds living close to the Turkish border. In late 2019, Turkish-backed groups previously affiliated with ISIS and Al-Qaeda started their cleansing campaign, posting videos of summary executions, mutilated corpses, and threatening Kurds. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights has reported the execution of Kurdish civilians at checkpoints. Furthermore, Human Rights Watch has documented Kurdish homes being confiscated en masse. This forced over 300,000 to flee. Meanwhile, Turkish President Erdogan 
openly stated that Turkey intends to fill depopulated Kurdish areas with Arab Syrians who currently reside in Turkey as refugees. In short, we supply weapons to Turkey, who is accused of ethnically cleansing Kurds. The UK government responded by briefly suspending new arms licenses to Turkey, but it still allowed pre-existing licenses to be honoured. The suspension was short-lived, as by 2020, export licenses started to be approved once again. Export licenses valued at around £481 million were permitted up to the end of 2021. This figure does not include open licenses, which allow unlimited deliveries of certain military equipment and are frequently issued to Turkey. This is despite reports from the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights that Turkish border guards have been shooting and killing Syrians attempting to cross the border and Turkish-led ethnic cleansing of Kurds continues. The UK government also chooses increased militarised borders over genuine help for Syrian refugees along Syria's other borders. For example, in 2015 and 2019 they sent Jordan non-lethal military border aid and training of around 11 million. On the Lebanese border, the UK government has invested 273 million in equipping and training the Lebanese army, including the training of 7,000 military border guards, as well as supplying Lebanon with 38 militarised watchtowers. Rather than run comprehensive refugee resettlement schemes, the UK government opts for militarised approaches. In 2020, for example, we resettled just 829 refugees from Syria. This can be seen in the wider context of militarised borders and armed companies' involvement in both selling weapons that cause people to flee their countries of residence and selling the equipment that puts barriers in the way of them making it to safety. In combination with this, the British government offers very little protection of those people. For example, the UK currently runs resettlement schemes for only three countries. Afghanistan, Hong Kong and Ukraine. All three schemes have been criticised for their lack of effect. Whilst those who seek protection in the UK outside of these schemes are threatened to be sent to Rwanda. In summary, the British government and arms trade have supplied and attempted to supply precursor chemical weapons to Bashar al-Assad, a known non-signatory of the Chemical Weapons Convention during the Civil War, who would go on to gas his own people. They also continue to sell weapons to Turkey, who are shooting and killing Syrian civilians trying to cross into safety, and who are leading a campaign of ethnic cleansing on its border, whilst offering little in terms of protections for those who have fled. Those that defend such arms sales continually state that export licenses are only granted after strict licensing criteria has been met. But as we have seen in this short case study on displacement and border militarization, this is a complete fabrication and such statements could be deemed as laughable if it did not enable such atrocious actions to take place. So Kirsten, the first question, which in some ways is not dissimilar to the question you asked, Matt. I mean, I'm sitting here experiencing an extreme case of deja vu because you think, you know, you're talking here about ethnic cleansing, chemical weapons, open licenses. And I'm thinking Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Gaza. I mean, draw us some of the sort of the parallels and the links and why are we seeing what seems similar things happening again and again, but as Matt was suggesting, getting worse and worse. I, having spent a, a certain amount of time talking to uh, one of our partner organizations, Makan, uh, who uh, are based in Palestine and, and work, work here. And, and they always like to make the point that um, many Palestinians are refugees themselves. They're refugees in their own country. They're refugees, uh, you know, across the, the what might be described as the nominal borders that that existed at the time. So many of them are are, are living in, in in refugee camps. And what's also true is that they are targeted 
by in this particular case the Israeli military uh, as and you know the, those camps themselves are not safe and I think as as you're watching some of the stuff here um, with the Turkish border and 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 with the war that's going on uh, in, in Syria again it's that inability of people to 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 flee warfare and to get to safety and being present prevented from doing that by as we've seen watchtowers yes. fences armed guards and all of us i think as we've as we've seen some of the stuff that's, that's been happening in in gaza again seeing people trying to get away from the war and yet being blocked by fences armed guards watchtowers it repeats again and again and again and it seems that some societies some of the societies that we're looking at that seems to be what they think of as a solution and and we need to come up with better solutions for for conflict and 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 and, and different different but but surely there are dimensions of our own regulatory regimes that are clearly failing i mean the film speaks of open licenses to Turkey. Can you explain to us what an open license is? And we hear from government government ministers and, you know, since sort of the time of Margaret Thatcher, the Labour prime ministers in between, through to Cameron and until today, we hear ministers repeating over and over again, Britain has one of the most rigorous arms export regimes in the world. I mean, how could it how could it be any worse? How could our arms export control regime allow us to play more of a role in in appalling human suffering? Um, I, I think I, I would say that um, like many people, anybody that claims to be an expert in British uh, arms export licenses um, probably is slightly exaggerating, but I, I, I'll answer the question. Open licenses are, um, they're supposed to be for non-controversial materials. They're supposed to be a way of uh, essentially saying, well, there's some stuff that we, that, that we ship that nobody really minds about, you know, let's put this through this so-called open license regime where effectively uh, a, an arms company can uh, apply for set of export uh, uh, ex exports and particular products to particular destinations and can pretty much send unlimited amounts of that stuff without anybody tracking it it's supposed to be for non-controversial stuff but what we're seeing here what we're seeing with 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 the saudis what we're seeing with with, with israel is that actually these are components for weapons that quite often these are the things that are keeping the planes in the air that are keeping the bombs falling on 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 innocent people so in fact they shouldn't be called open licenses they should be called opaque licenses um and we we had a we have a, a kind of little we website called rigorous repetition where they keep rigorously repeating the fact that they have a rigorous arm system and all i can do is i i can i can we can we can point to yemen which we just talked about which saw the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people um for, from 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 a, a, a from weapons that continue to be shipped two, three billion pounds a year, every year. We see with Turkey, the, the example that we're just looking at, over the last year, we have shipped something like 100 million pounds of, of fighter technology. Uh, we've, we've, we've sent across, the, the UK has sent across something like 250, 250 million pounds of, of technology for tanks. And yet we know what's happening. We know what they're doing with that technology. So clearly um, there's no kind of control. And, and Katie is sitting here, who's your parliamentary liaison officer. What about parliamentary oversight? Isn't that what sort of happens in a liberal democracy? Um, well, yes, and I, 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 I think the, the answer is that um, in, in theory, there is there is a structure, the, the sort of uh, combined committee for arms export control. But I think what we're tending to find is that that committee often doesn't meet, often if it does meet, doesn't necessarily have a really good set of information. The people who might be on that committee, you know, are doing the best they can. I'm, I'm absolutely sure, or maybe they're not. Um, but what, what's also true is they're not having an impact on some of these dreadful arms exports. And so this broken system 
that people were, were hoping would suddenly stop arms exports to Israel for Gaza. Of course, it's not going to do that. That's not what it's for. So. A final question. Um, chemical weapons. And it, the, the film gives a very interesting take on the use of chemical weapons and how we export them. I mean, we saw their horrific use in Syria. One of the justifications given for the invasion of Iraq was the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein, which interestingly had been sold to him by a company of which Donald Rumsfeld was a senior executive who of course became the American Secretary for Defense when America invaded Iraq. And there, there was footage of him actually selling these weapons to Saddam Hussein or negotiating the sale of them. And we see in Gaza now, the sale from America, from two American companies in Alabama, white phosphorus to Israel in ever increasing quantities. But then we circle all the way around and, and, and the film shows extremely well all of these people who are forced to flee conflict, who either get sort of almost herded into places to remain in the areas of conflict or when they try and escape them or stop from coming into our countries. Am I being naive here, but isn't that quite a good business too? Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the things that we've increasingly discovered is, is that the companies that are, if you like, profiting from the war that, that, their, that their weapons are creating are also profiting from the um, systems of, of, of of oppression of militarized borders that 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 stop people fleeing those wars. So examples would be companies like Thales, who who are both suppliers of, of weaponry into into the region, but also suppliers of 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 drones that 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 watch over the English Channel for these for the for the for the, for the boats that that people are taking because they they have no legal way to reach here safely. So they're having to 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 use desperate measures. Um, and I, th I think the final thing I wanted to say, um, uh, this on Thursday night in, in my hometown, there will be half a dozen refugees sleeping in the local church hall. And the reason is that they're doing that is because the government, when it, when it grants people kind of asylum status, gives them no time at all to find any accommodation. And so unless they're sleeping on that, that church hall, I'm going to say church hall floor, yeah. they, they are, they're sleeping out in the cold because the government support is simply not there to provide the accommodation that, that, that they need. And yet we can provide 38 watchtowers, as we were talking about, and, and train 7,000 Lebanese border guards. What on earth are we thinking? So, you know, that for me, that's the thing. It's like we, you know, <laughs> we're literally having to put up refugees on church floors yeah. while, <laughs> while putting up watchtowers in Lebanon. I, I've got nothing else to say. It's it's quite astonishing. I think what this film and, and what you've told us here about your own neighborhood and and the refugees who have who have come to your neighborhood in search of, of refuge in the interests of of these people, the films that we're showing and the others that we have available, it is just so crucial to anybody anywhere in the UK who is watching the suffering that we experience in Gaza at the moment. And of course, the human consequences that we don't see, the people who are having to flee, the ethnic cleansing that lies behind it, which I was so interested to see was mentioned in so many of these films. And just remind ourselves that these films desperately, desperately need to be taken around the UK. Thank you very much. And we'll be talking about that later. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So we're going to move to the, the, the third of our three films uh, today. Um, and uh, Jen Seller is joining us from Demilitarize Education. De education, thank you uh, for joining us. And we're going to be talking about the myths of, well, say more. <laughs> yes. Yes, so hi, everyone. Take this up. Demilitarized Education, um, I'm one of the co-founders, we have our other co-founder, we have our Chief of Operations and our Database Manager over there, so big ups to the team. Um, we work to break the ties between UK universities and the arms trade. And I know that many of you will probably be like severely disappointed with the 
level of response to the genocide happening in Gaza right now. And of course, all the illegal conflicts which Britain has been supporting. And this comes back to the root of our education system right now. And our partners at Forces Watch, they've been doing amazing research into the lower levels of education. Um, and we at Demilitarized Education look at the university system. We're right next to Imperial College as well, which um, we have a report coming out in a few weeks in partnership with Campaign Against Arms Trade that goes into detail about how Imperial College are advancing in a part of the military industrial academic complex. And it's really, really interesting because back in the 80s when there was like mass privatization of our public research centers, there was a natural push for government to move research and promote universities to be places where, well, they actually said they're overfunded and too academic and they weren't in line with like the industry goals. And this was part of their kind of plan to push arms partnerships within that education system. And now people are waking up, you know, as Matt said, like people have changed and this is very prevalent on social media and the communities we're speaking to, even at demilitarized education, we've had influx of volunteers and it's sad it's taken this long, but our education system has been co-opted into manipulating people, fear mongering, so that by the time you even reach university, you believe that the arms trade is essential in our national security. And you almost feel naive to look beyond that and use our knowledge centers, our educational capacity to advance, you know, past illegal conflict, past the arms trade and into pair based economies. So seven myths that sustain the global arms trade. It's a seven part video series based on the book, which was co-authored by the absolute Don that is Andrew Feinstein. Um, and it was funded by the World Peace Foundation, which we have many friends who are part of. And really it is about kind of letting go of this, this like, I don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this handcuff system where people are too scared to imagine beyond what we have right now. And the myths, like the, the overarching narrative around that creates so much fear to the point, even when we're watching it, we're scared to really say how it is. And the seven myths that sustain the glo global arms trade, um, the book was called Indefensible. And this video series, um, which you'll see me and Mel in, is just a way for people to engage with this issue and break down those myths so we can use them as tools to, rather than just go along with something we know is deeply wrong and you know, evil, we can actually use these as uh, resource tools to be able to stand up against these myths, change the narrative and work for not just an education system as UNICEFCO are promoting so that helps us survive the climate catastrophe that is happening right now, you know, the <laughs> the um, plan for education to support sustainable development. But for us to like, okay, I lost my point there, but that's it really. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll we'll look at the first film. Uh, we'll look at the, the the third of the the three films. So the myth, first. The, the first of the seven films, third of the three that we're showing tonight. So uh, myth myth number one, the myth uh, regarding security oh, yes regarding that um increased defense spending does not equal increased security there it is every year countries increase their defense spending but do you feel more secure uh, increasing defense spending by 24.1 billion pounds over the next four years what if spending more money on defense actually made us less secure Truth is, our defense spending and the global arms trade isn't actually making us any safer. In this seven video series, we'll explore how our defense spending needs rethinking. 
and invite you to join our community of modern day peacemakers. Security. It's something we hear politicians say all the time. But what does security really mean? Have you ever heard of human security? It means protecting things like access to food and water, access to Wi-Fi and tech, good health for all, job security, secure housing. Our focus on state military forces has taken priority over other human security needs. Government budgets show bucket loads of taxpayers' money always goes towards national defense. How did it get so out of hand? During the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century, manufacturing became quick and very efficient. People had more jobs, and for weapons manufacturing, the sky was the limit. As each of the empires progressed in developing their industries, international rivalry got hotter until finally the pressure popped and sparked the war that would change the course of warfare forever, World War I. In the World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. Given the post-war trauma, this would have been a great time to use innovation and communication to, I don't know, figure out peace. But weapons manufacturing boosted the economy and politicians realized the high potential for profit, including for themselves personally, from selling weapons abroad. This accelerated during World War II, and especially the Cold War, when the USA and the Soviet Union went head-to-head -to, -head to become the next global superpower. Their military competition led to a race to the moon and weapons of mass destruction, like nuclear weapons, which pushed military spending and global insecurity to new heights. Even though the US and USSR never officially went to war, they were still involved in violent conflict, just not on their own turf. During the Cold War, there were dozens of proxy wars and civil wars, and support for wars all over the world was given by the US and friends and the Soviets in arms sales to whatever side would promote their ideals. They were taking sides, providing military equipment and training from afar without directly fighting. Talk about a setup for the people on the ground, am I right? Even after the US won the Cold War, this didn't stop. In fact, the arms trade accelerated at full speed. States continued to sell weapons and support wars all over the world for profit and political domination. How is that chance of peace looking now, huh? It's time to talk about the military-industrial complex. The military-industrial complex, or the MIC, is an informal alliance between a nation's military and their defense industry that supplies it, seen together as a vested interest which influences public policy. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. The special relationship between the for-profit defense industry, our government, and the military is vital to the MIC. Lobbying, which we'll explain in the next video, has a massive role to play in this cycle. Together with the revolving door between weapons companies and government and the media's role in promoting militarism, you get the perfect setting for arms companies to heavily influence security spending and policy. Just to be clear, we believe the armed forces and veterans deserve the utmost respect. We're not denying that. The military spending system, however, needs some work. This system, as Eisenhower warned, enables the arms trade to flourish with little to no scrutiny. The Iraq War is the perfect case study for this. Referred to sometimes as the biggest waste of military spending in recent history. And it actually made the problem at hand way worse. In 2003, it was announced that the UK would be joining the US in the war in Iraq. Word on the street was that Saddam Hussein, Iraq's dictator, was stockpiling weapons of mass destruction and obviously had to be stopped. 
American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Oh, and while they'd be over there, they'd also make sure to overthrow their entire political and social structure, instilling democracy and freedom to these backward societies. Overall, coalition forces spent over $3 trillion in Iraq from 2001 to 2014. And all this time, weapons companies were persuading our governments what military equipment they should buy and sell. I mean, it was literally in their interest to keep the war going. And on top of that, some of this money went missing. Here's what Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney had to say about that. $21 billion can be flown on pallets into Iraq. No wonder you're missing billions of dollars. And there's ghost employees, no employees, the money is missing, the money is lost. It's not lost, somebody got it. $2.3 trillion wasn't lost, somebody got it. Tony Blair himself made millions after he left office because of his decision to go to Iraq. Millions. Seriously, look it up. He profited like many others from this war. After the invasion, to this day, we do not see anything close to freedom and democracy in Iraq. What we did see, however, was torture in Abu Ghraib, where prisoners were humiliated and tortured by the CIA. The chaos of war meant that extremist groups like ISIS could seize power in what had become huge, lawless sections of the country. What's more, many of the weapons these terrorist groups are using are, you guessed it, manufactured in the West. Nice one, Blair and Bush. Yeah, good job. We must remember that our politicians were made very aware of the risks of military intervention in Iraq. Political and civil resistance against the war was huge. Altogether, between 6 and 10 million people took part in protests against this war in up to 60 countries. I have never met anyone who wants their country to invade another country and occupy that country except the people who are so-called fighting the war on terror. They are the ones who are creating terror all over the world. Since 9-11, terrorism has been pinned on the back of Muslim communities. And the good guys, AKA Western powers, went on a mission to find this big nasty guy hiding away in some desert somewhere to bring him to justice. Criticisms for the war on terror have continued to grow, with some questioning, how do you even fight terror? U.S.-backed counter-terror operations since 9-11 have touched over 85 countries in just the past three years alone. From 2001 to 2020, the U.S. has spent an estimated $6.4 trillion on these operations. Jeffrey Sachs, one of the world's leading economists in international development, even stated that the cost to end world poverty could be achieved at just $175 billion per year. This puts into perspective how much money is wasted in our current defense system and how much more we could achieve if we committed to improve these systems. At the end of the day, the real cost is human lives. Over 800,000 people have been killed as a result of the war on terror and many, many more indirectly due to malnutrition, infrastructure damage and environmental degradation. And of course, Let's not forget about the 7 million people who have been displaced or become refugees. The impact on Western soldiers has also been detrimental. And on return to the US in 2008, veteran deaths reached on average 17 a day. The War on Terror, which includes the Iraq War, are both examples of how increased military spending has not made us more secure. As Veterans for Peace say, war is not the solution to the problems we face in the 21st century. So, 
Are we going to continue spending our defense budget on more military operations, supporting more wars and destruction, or are we going to rethink security and spend taxpayers' money in ways that actually make us safe? All in all, it's pretty dead, right? But our community of modern day peacemakers are working against this from universities. And there's a place for you to join the movement. Thanks so much for watching. Support our mission by hitting subscribe and that bell. And remember, we ain't dead yet. Hello. The one thing that I think we definitely need to do is demilitarize education. But that means that we got to get the Pentagon out of our elementary schools, our high schools, our universities. We've got to demilitarize our society. We've got to get the Pentagon out of our football teams. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just everywhere. Our society has been militarized to the extent that we can be dropping bombs right now, literally all over the world as I make this recording and life goes on for the average American person, but not so for the people who are underneath U.S. bombs. It must stop. It's got to stop. And I support demilitarized education. Thank, thank you very much. And we're joined by uh, Emma from Forces Watch. Um, Emma, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just saying a little bit about uh, what Forces Watch is and what, and what you do. Mm, okay. Um, well, we've been going since 2010. Um, and we kind of look at militarism in the uk militarization recent militarization within the uk um particularly how it affects young people so um recruitment into the armed forces but also um in schools the way that the military um have um become a fixture in primary and secondary schools and um we've recently been doing quite a bit of research on the way arms companies are uh, to some extent piggybacking on that to get into schools, but also have their own relationship with, with schools. Um, yeah. Will, thank you. Um, I, I'm, so um, obviously we, we were hearing about um, security and, and, and how um, what we would think of as security, things like, for example, flood defense security maybe, or uh, food security or housing security it has really been turned into this kind of militarized view of what security means. And I was going to ask the question, how does the education system contribute to that? Um, uh, either Gincella or, or Emma, what, 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 what do you think? Hmm? I mean, obviously, the education is really um, important, a sort of um, authoritative space where young people sort of um, receive narratives around kind of the way to look at the world um, and that's why it's a very contested space it's why the armed forces want to get in there it's why defense companies want to get in there for their future workforce and also to create um, um, a sense of consent um, in society uh, for their activities so um, it, it's very much a, a you know a vital space for anyone who wants to have have you know, shape the world of the future. Thank you. Insella, what do you think? Yeah, I'd say like the Western education system as well is largely built on creating obedience for the state that is currently in power. Um, and, you know, it was originally a Prussian system which like went to the US and that it's in the DNA that they're trying to create obedient civilians that will join the army and will... Um, you know, be a happy member of the workforce, right? And um, therefore, like, using the education system and allowing arms companies in is, you know, detrimental. It's, I, I always think of Peace Pledge Union's research, um, which found, it was a few years ago now, wasn't it? But it was, um, they found that the UK government had spent over forty-two million pounds promoting military ethos in schools since 2012. Military ethos is the need to aggressively defend one's own interests, and this is at a time we desperately need to be thinking as a collective. You know, if you're thinking with that individualistic mindset, not only is it 
terrible for mental health and like well-being of children but it's also terrible for the urgent survival strategy that we need right now to tackle the problems we're facing so when that gets through to the education system uh, the university system which is much more focused on like your investment into the labor force of course it's much more coercive in terms of money you know return on your investment and really it's our universities our great knowledge centers which hold the power that could be leading us towards the solutions we want to live in a peaceful just world however it's a very very well it's it's a non decision for students who are putting down 40k going to be in years and years of debt um and need to have a job when they come out of the end of it and of course arms companies are being part of that funnel system to use student capacity for their arms oriented advancement so i really believe wholeheartedly that education is a leverage point for change in a better world and while the arms trade is a part of it that isn't going to happen i mean i think one of the things we we're, we're you know that motivates me particularly is that sense of sort of exploitation of young people's um you know, want for their own kind of to have a decent job and and life themselves, but also their sort of ideals and and um, you know that that they don't know who these companies are um, because often the, the materials or uh, activities they're doing are not actually about defence. That they they might even be about environmental things or climate change or whatever. Um, but it's still BAE, it's still the Navy or the Arm, uh, the RAF sort of coming in and doing the workshop and sort of promoting themselves, but but using other um, content in order to do that. And it's really exploitative and, and manipulative. And I think that is a massive ethical problem, apart from all the other ethical problems. That, that's brilliant. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm seeing some hands raised, but before I before I, I I take the questions, what I'd like to do is just talk about the tour, and then if you like, I'll take one question from online, and then one a couple of questions from in the room. So, first thing to say, um, if you would like an event like this, perhaps not with as many films or as many speakers, but you know, hopefully as many as many people in the room, um, you'll see on the screen there is a QR code. That QR code links you to the resource pack that tells you what films are available what kind of um, uh, speakers might be available. I'd also uh, not been able to do one today, what kind of workshops can be run in your community uh, to, to help you kind of break some of the stuff that we're telling about, to kind of break the kind of, uh, the, the shall we say, the, the negative education that people are receiving from, from the militaristic complex that we've just seen that leads to that funneling of weapons and that lack of, lack of compassion that we've seen in, um, in the films that, that we have. And I'm, I'm seeing some hands raised, but I, I would like to go to the um, uh, the online audience. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm, I, do you want to do you want to bring the micro? Do you want to to come down, Rona? We've got a, the microphone here. Even if it's just a... uh, okay. Uh, do you want to grab grab the microphone and and, and do it? So uh, I, I, uh, I think um, I'm seeing I'm seeing a jump at the back. Uh, do you want to mind talking to the microphone? Um, and so, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my... that, the microphone is for the people who aren't in the room. So oh, please sorry. raise your voice. Okay. Right. So my question: I've been studying supply chains for the last ten years. Of you know all these minerals, they come from the global south. And there was this lady at the end. She was talking about the climate change emergency. My question is: Whenever I see, whether it's Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq. Yeah, okay, the military, the Americans, the French, the British are there in those countries. But my natural inclination is to always ask, what are they there for other than terrorise the people? And as has been shown in all the seven countries, the Muslim countries that were in, in, intended to be destroyed and bombed, all those seven countries are rich, trillions of dollars worth of resources. And those resources, they've got some oil, but most of those resources are essential for the Green New Deal, for going net zero. So my question is that if we are really concerned about the Yemenis or the Syrians or all those people, and we also want to solve climate change, are we really taking a serious look at the 
serious direct links between the arms trade and if there wasn't an arms trade we wouldn't be able to get all these resources we we need for the green new deal we've got to accept that and actually see are we funding it ourselves indirectly and saying we don't want the arms trade but we also want the green new deal which is also based on the arms trade thank you thank, thank you a, a, a great question and i'm I'm wondering if I can um, have the microphone returned to to because Gintella, do you have some thoughts on this? Because we're talking about myths and connections and 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 real security. And if if you don't, that that's okay. That's okay as well. Yeah, I think there is obviously like major, you know, the the mining for the Western trans energy transition is massively under spoken about and I would definitely direct you to one of our board of directors that is Dr. Olamide Samuel who has written a really really good article addressing this. Um, I can't really say much on, else on that in terms of like you know at what extent do we put halts on you know obviously the arms trade can't be the mind behind our green transition but of course we do need a transition that is beyond exploiting other countries. I do believe that um, university knowledge and capacity could be deeply harnessed to discover how to best do that. Thank you so much. And I, I'm afraid we've really only got time for one more question and, and it's, I mean, we're gonna take, take one from our online things. I, I'm so sorry that we, time has kind of beaten us a little bit. Yeah, we've had a couple of questions on the chat online about what parallels there are between the sales and support of Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen and Israel's war in Gaza, and what information there is about the supply routes for weapons that are being shipped to Israel. If you like, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, I, I won't use the microphone because I, I, I'm mic'd up, as they say. Um, so the first thing I would, I would highlight uh, is, is Kat's most updated fact sheet, uh, which uh, copies of which are available in the room. And um, uh, a lot of that has come from research. I'm, I'm looking across at other people who are in the room who help put this research together, um, who, who talk a lot about um, uh, what is being shipped to Israel, where it's being made, and, and what it, its role is in, it, is in the conflict. So um, it, it, you, like, you can either pick up a copy of this, this, this fact sheet here, or you can, you can download it online. Um, and, and what I would say as well is that uh, on, on that on the online version of the fact sheet, it links to many other resources. And I'm looking across at Katie because we should be having a map come out fairly soon that uh, that that talk that shows the UK. of the UK that shows shows where it where it it comes from. And there's also the website that I have. There's also a website. Yeah. Workers in Palestine um, have also done a website that tracks not just the UK but globally. And yeah, that, that's right. So um, we'd rec certainly recommend you look at the Workers in Palestine uh, website, and in fact, we'll make sure a link to that goes out with 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 the notes from 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 this from tonight. And that's that's been put together with an international um, group of uh, of experts, both showing, you know, country by country what's what's coming where, but also how it how it's fitting together. What I should also say is, is that a lot of it is not well known. It's not well known to, to all of us. And, and some of it is, is, is still being discovered. We're still trying to work out what, what particular companies are doing, what they're shipping. Some of them have hundreds of blooming arms export licenses. And we can't really tell what for. Um, that's the level of, of how difficult and opaque this thing is. So um, all, I, all I can say is that that we together discover what's going on and sharing it, finding out in local communities what, what bothers them, finding out from, from local communities, perhaps near the Wharton site, what's being shipped, what's being made, what's being done. All of it builds, builds that knowledge that we're all looking for. So I'm afraid, as I say, time has beaten us. I'm really sorry we can't take everybody's questions. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a chance to be able to, to chat after afterwards. For those online, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been great to have you. Um, uh, and for those in the room, thank you for, 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 for traveling and coming here and a uh, uh, safe trip home. Thank you very much indeed.